Hey church, why don't we just take a moment and let's worship the Lord one last time before we enter into the Word of God. And as we close our eyes and as we lift our hands to Him, let's meditate and think about what He has done in our life. When we're singing, God is good, how has He been good to you? Consider everything that He has done in your life, the lives around you, the generations that came before you. Father, we just thank you for this evening, God. We thank you that your sweet presence is here with us, dwells within believers. And I thank you that in you is hope, not just for eternity, but hope for now. I thank you that even in your presence, you cast out fear even right now and help us to receive your word in a way that truly causes lasting change. Any distraction or noise in our minds right now, I ask you to silence the static, the worry, the whispers of the enemy so that we could truly hear you clearly. Help us to do whatever it is you say. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. You can go ahead and take a seat. I am uh, really excited for this evening. We're opening up a new theme uh, here in this month, and it's called Prescription for Healthy for a healthy life, and if you came in, you should have received one of these handouts. If you didn't, go ahead and raise up your hand real high, and uh, the ushers will get it to you. And uh, I love it. It uh, kind of looks like a thing that you can write notes on, and uh, it's got a theme verse that will kind of tie together each week, kind of uh, modeled after uh, a doctor's uh, prescription script. And um, on Wednesdays, what we're going to endeavor to do, if we're talking about this healthy life, we're going to be focusing on negative emotions and how to uh, be able to engage with those so that we can protect our healthy lives. On the weekends, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about life-giving truths and practices and how to promote and stimulate a healthy life. But what we want to do as a family is, uh, kind of at the beginning of each of these sessions for this theme, we're going to read the scripture together that's at the bottom. And if you don't have it, no big deal. It's going to be on the screens. And so let's go ahead and prepare to read uh, Proverbs Chapter 4, verse 20, and I'll start us off and just read with me. Ready? One, two, three. Dear friends, listen well to my words. Tune your ears to my voice. Keep my message in plain view at all times. Concentrate. Learn it by heart. Those who discover these words live, really live, body and soul. They're bursting with health. I love that last phrase. They're bursting with health. Verse 22 in the ESV says it this way, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Literally, that word healing means medicine or it means the cure. That if you listen to my words, my words will become a cure to your body and to your flesh. You know, recently I went in to um, have my annual physical. How many of you guys love going to the doctor? Yeah, pretty much, yeah, just like me. I hate going to the doctor. Hey, any doctors, nurses out there, we love you, but hey, it, it's kind of like this philosophy that we don't believe anything's wrong, so why should we go? And so uh, I just had this uh, annual physical. It had been a while since I'd gone, and thankfully there's the Holy Spirit nudging me, and if you're married, probably your spouse nudging you even harder, saying you need to go. So I went, and it's funny, each and every time that I go, uh, they have what's called, or what I call, the weigh-in. You know what I'm talking about when they take you to that massive scale. And I'm walking up to it, and I'm immediately having flashbacks of all the bad food I ate that month. I'm like, no, like, this is my time of accountability. Like, they're going to know, like, oh, Mr. Robert, looks like you've gained some weight here. I'm like, so I'm emptying my pockets, trying to take off my shoes. Oh, no, sir, you don't have to take off. No, I want to take off my shoes. I want to take off my shoes. And then never fa it never fails. I get on it, and right before I step on it, for some reason, I inhale and suck it in. I'm like, <gasps> like just hoping like that'll make me lighter. It doesn't work. And then we get to the um, blood pressure machine where they're gonna take my blood pressure and, and, I'm, and I'm doing tricks with my mind. I'm like, imagine green pastures, <laughs> calm waters, monarch butterflies, and deers panting at the river. 
thinking that I could trick somehow my body into registering a good reading. And then I get in front of the doctor and he asks the question, um, how much have you been exercising lately? <laughs> right? And it's like, oh, this is why I don't like coming. And I'm like, well, if you count every morning that I'm with my kids, I do about 20 to 30 reps of picking them up and changing them and then packing lunches and then getting them in the car. And then, and then once we get to school, it's about a 100-yard dash to the gate because we're always running late and I don't want to get locked out. And, you know, so I exercise about five days a week and <laughs> just kind of like, yeah, right, that doesn't count. But then the doctor is there for my own good. He, he wants to find out what's happening with me. And he says, look, do you have any pain? Do you have any discomfort? Are there any symptoms that I need to know about? And immediately, like, it's like, yeah, right. Like, if there's anything going on, I ain't telling you. But for some reason, every time I'm in his office, once he asks that question, I tell on myself. I just, like, vomit everything that's going on. And I'm like, oh, yeah, now that you mention it, you know, I've been having, like, some chronic tension in my shoulders and my neck. And, and immediately, my inner self is like, what are you doing? And he's like, hmm, really? And I'm just like, great. But he really is looking out for my best interest. And he walks it through with me, tries to correctly diagnose what's going on. And if needed, he gives me a prescription or a method of treatment. And this month, we're talking about a prescription for a healthy life. And the thing that we need to understand is that your health goes beyond only skin deep. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. John makes a connection that it isn't just the physical health that's kind of the greatest thing to envy and go after. He says, no, 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 they're connected. That just as your soul prospers, I pray that you be in health. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 puts it this way. So above all, guard the affections of your heart for they affect all that you are. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being, for from there flows the wellspring of life. I love that. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being. When we're talking about a prescription for a healthy life, we are talking about our inner world. We're talking about you, the person behind those eyes. And so tonight... What we're going to talk about is we are going to tackle the topic of anger. All right, ushers, you have permission. Go ahead and lock the doors. Nobody can leave. <laughs> no, just joking. It's going to be okay. Because this isn't, I, I really pray and hope that you don't come into this thinking that you're going to hear from some pastor on this topic. I'm believing that we're going to hear from the great physician, Jesus himself to speak to us and through the Spirit of God be able to do what no man can do. We are familiar with verses like by his stripes we are healed and thank God for promises like that. But he also doesn't just heal our bodies. He heals the hidden places as well. The places that no man can touch. The places where no operation or no surgery can be performed. Inside of your very soul. He wants to bring us into his office and tell us the importance, the true importance of why you're really here tonight. He knows those things. He wants to ask you questions like, do you have any pain? Do you have any discomfort? Do you have any symptoms? And then allow the Holy Spirit to diagnose us and say, I have just the prescription for you. So if you have your Bibles or electronic device, go ahead and turn to the letter of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and while you're turning there, I'm going to give you a dictionary definition of what is anger, because then we're going to look to the Word of God to unpack truly what anger is. Anger or wrath is an intense emotional state. It involves a strong, uncomfortable, and hostile response to a perceived provocation, hurt, or threat. Now let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus in verse chapter 26. We'll pick it up there. It says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. I didn't know you can do both of those at the same time. Like, I didn't know. I thought those were mutually exclusive. But actually, Paul quotes Psalm Chapter 4, verse 4 says this, Be angry 
and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Selah. Pastor Bayless explained last week that Selah means stop the music and think about and ponder what you just sang. It's a moment to reflect. Ponder on your own hearts on your beds. Paul's saying, look, I'm not saying you can't be angry. Anger is a natural human emotion. In fact, I believe it's a mark from God that comes from his righteous anger in terms of what he is, a, what he is owed, his kingdom, and what he's going to establish. Any deviation from that, there is a right to want to fix it, to want to be able to bring about what God is owed himself. But we mustn't allow anger to lead us into sin where we believe we are owed, to where we justify withholding love from others, and maybe even sometimes, once it grows, inflicting intentional pain or harm on people. Paul's saying, look, you need to learn to contend with it, to expose it daily, which is why he says, as the sun goes down, as the cycle of every day completes, this is how much we need to contend with anger. He says, lest you give the enemy opportunity. And I love the NIV. It says, a foothold. How many of you guys have um, seen the documentary Free Solo? It's on Netflix. It's about a climb, climber who does free climbing, and he free climbs El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. Now, El Capitan, if you're unfamiliar, is one of the largest uh, sheer faces of granite in the world. And this guy climbs it, with no equipment and no people, no cables, no ropes, just him, his hands, and, and a bag of chalk. Like, talk about beast mode. And this guy, in certain areas of this face, the, the, the grip size, the foothold that's available for him is the size of half of your fingernail. And the amount of training it shows in this documentary for him to scale this is he builds up the strength in his fingers and his body to be able to use half the size of your fingernail if need be. And he, he anticipates that, that this is the only bit I'm going to get, so I need to train for this. And what Paul is trying to say is that that is how the enemy works as well. The smallest things in your life that you would deem insignificant when it comes to offense, when it comes to anger. Oh, no, that's no big deal. Like, like that, that was so long ago, I'm kind of over it. Like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, they really hacked me off, but you know, you know, whatever, like they're going through stuff and it's, it's all good. We need to be aware of what we're doing with our anger. Because Paul is saying, even the smallest of foothold, the enemy can scale up and build up resentment and bitterness in our hearts, and the most impossible feats, the most peaceful of persons that you would never assume to ever have anger growing in them is done from the smallest leverage points. James writes in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And James uses these phrases. He says, you desire, you covet, you do not have. And he's trying to communicate to the local church, and God's trying to communicate to us, that anger stems from what we don't have. Anger stems from what we sense has been stolen from us. I like the way that Henry Nouwen writes. He says, anger is the impulsive response to being deprived. Quite simply, anger is not getting something we want. Anger is what we feel we deserve. Another author said, anger says, you owe me. You owe me. You owe me. You owe me. They owe me. He owes me. She owes me. And the dangerous thing about this is that if someone owes you for too long, eventually everyone will owe you. It bleeds into every part of our being. Paul goes on to write in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, 
forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Paul uses this phrase, he says, put it away from you. It is not a passive phrase or descriptor that he uses. How many of you guys hate spiders in this house? All right, sweet. I have some fellow spider haters. I can't stand spiders. <laughs> Little daddy long legs, jumping spiders, cool, whatever. I, I don't like them in my space. But, but brown widows, black widows, I am like spider hunter. I am, I, I am like... I am like an expert trained ninja. My wife cracks up all the time. Like I am hunting these things down in my backyard because I got my little kids. I know when they come out. I know the time of day. I know what their webs look like, what their eggs look like. I got poison. I got my chunkla out. I'm like smacking them, killing them. I'm like, you have no place here. I hate spiders. <laughs> but even if you like spiders, have you ever walked into a spider web? You hit your face? I don't know anybody in the history of the world who's walked into a spider web in their face and be like, oh. <laughs> oh, a spider web. Oh. Just casually taking it off. No, dude, they're like, ah! Oh! <laughs> Screaming like a girl, like smacking out their face, maybe doing the fire drill on the ground. It is the most eerie thing in the world. This is what Paul is talking about. When anger comes in your heart, put it away from you with the same urgency that you would have if you walked into a spider web. It is not your friend. It is not something to be trifled with. And you might be in here tonight talking to God, be like, but Doc, I don't have an anger issue. I don't yell. I'm not violent. I just have drama in my life and other issues that I want you to address. And I really sense that God was trying to say to us, even as I was preparing, but you don't understand. There's a connection that you don't see in your life. You know, my wife Natalie, we were playing tennis uh, a few years ago, and uh, we were playing tennis, and she stepped wrong, and she rolled her ankle. And we, like, we tried to play, but it was like pretty bad, and so we're like, okay, it's cool, just call it quits, and then uh, try to ice it up and take care of it, and you know, it, it hurt for a while, but eventually over time, healed up, never thought about it again. Then a few years later, she was having some back issues, and she went to go to the chiropractor, one of our friends who now moved back east, because it was just bothering her really bad. And so she went in to see him, and he's kind of checking her out, wasn't saying anything. And the first question he asks her after checking her alignment is, have you ever hurt your right ankle? <laughs> and she's like, What? Like, no, well, well, wait a minute. Yeah, now that you think, now that you say it, two years ago, I rolled my ankle playing tennis, but it doesn't hurt anymore, and that's not why I'm here. And he's like, no, you don't understand. When you injured your ankle, how you favored it set your back and your hips out of alignment. One injury triggered other symptoms. And we could respond to our great physician the same way. God's asking us, has, has anger ever overtaken you? You're like, what are you talking about, God? Like, well, yeah, like maybe 10 years ago or maybe a few years ago, when really maybe a couple weeks ago. <laughs> but this doesn't hurt anymore. And, and quite frankly, that's not why I'm here at church. <laughs> I got other issues going on. He's like, no, you don't understand. It's all connected. One injury triggers other symptoms. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to be able to uh, show you and reveal from Scripture certain indicators of anger. Symptoms, if you will, of anger. And what I want to do, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I want you, when you hear these symptoms, to consider not it from a general uh, scope of life. In other words, like, does this apply to me in all areas of life? No. Most of the time, if anger has taken root, it is not with everyone that you know. It may, only, it, it may not apply to 99% of the people you know, but there's that one person. Oh, you know that person. <laughs> there's that one family member. Come on. <laughs> there's that one coworker. There's that one neighbor. There's that one group of people. There's that one entity that we look towards and we're like, hmm. So let's go through these symptoms. Symptom number one. 
You escalate conflict. A little chuckle. You escalate conflict. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 18 says, A touchy, hot-tempered man or woman picks or instigates a fight, but the calm, patient man knows how to silence strife. This doesn't even have to be your fight. You don't even have to be in a conflict. You could be at work or school. People could be talking behind each other's backs. They could be gossiping, talking B, talking trash. You can come up along someone else's conflict, but you either make things worse or you bring peace. You know, in baseball, many of you would be familiar that there's starting pitchers in baseball, but then there's also relief pitchers and closers. Because most of the time, starting pitchers um, can't go the distance. They can't pitch nine innings. If they do, if they do it's a big deal. Um, and so either because they've given up too many runs or they've just thrown too many pitches, they'll bring in other pitchers to relief the starter, to relieve the starter, or a closer to win the game. And many times, hopefully, they save the game, they, they, they win it for the starter who, who perhaps did some good in the early innings, but if for some reason they blow it, if for some reason they can't stop the bleeding and they just totally lose the game for the starter and the team, there's an expression in sports, and it's this. Ah, they brought out the gas can. They turned this game into a dumpster fire. They pretty much bled all over this game and lost it for the team. And I have to ask you, when we enter conflict, when we enter our conflict, arguments, gossip, when we enter someone else's, it might not even be with 99% of the people in your life, but when someone is gossiping about that one person that you can care less about because they've hurt you, are we a gas can? Do we ignite what's going on? And you do not have to be volatile to do that. You do not have to be demonstrative and have a temper. We can be a quiet fire starter. Come on now. It's real quiet in here right now. I'm speaking from experience. We could be a quiet fire starter, but is there a symptom where you escalate conflict with certain or allow it to escalate with certain individuals? Symptom number two, your words have little impact on people. Your words have little impact on people. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 says, respond gently when you are confronted and you'll diffuse the rage of another. Responding with sharp cutting words will only make it worse. Don't you know that being angry will ruin the testimony of even the wisest of men? Once again, we're not talking about everybody in our lives, but is there certain people where we just don't care if we use harsh words, where we really don't care if we monitor the tone of our voice, because quite frankly, they deserve it. Uh, if, I, if I'm tired, I'm not giving you my best. You hurt me. I've let anger set in. We're careless with our words. But what the writer of Proverbs is trying to say, look, being a witness for Christ isn't about being eloquent with your words. It's about being gentle. In fact, people stop listening not because they disagree with you. People stop listening when they don't respect you. And if there's people in our lives where well, we're okay with using harsh words, where we let down our guard, or quite simply, we're just not aware of monitoring our body language or our tone. It actually has the ability for taking the most wisest man and ruining their testimony. Is there certain people we just can't get through to? Could it be that there's a root of anger? What about symptom number three? Unwise behavior and cloudy judgment. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. You know, when Natalie and I, um, and Jude and Numi, Numi is sitting on the front row playing with the iPhone. Hi, baby. Uh, when they were babies, uh, like anyone else who raised babies, uh, we got first row seats to sleep deprivation. <laughs> right? Should be like a, a form of torture. Every two hours waking up, you know the drill. 
But in that place, has any of you just felt like you were in a fog? Like the, a, a, literally a walking zombie? Like don't know your name, don't know what day it is, just completely out of it. And what the writer of Proverbs is saying, he's saying an uncontrolled temper will give you a fog brain. Ever said to yourself, what was I thinking? You ever come out of a season or make a decision in haste, and after you, you say to yourself, what in the world was I thinking? You weren't thinking. <laughs> that is the point that the writer of Proverbs is trying to say. And maybe, just maybe, if we can trace there being a pattern of unwise decisions, of cloudy judgment, maybe not in all areas, maybe it's just in a certain area, could the Holy Spirit help diagnose, hey, this isn't just not being able to connect the dots and make a wise decision. This comes from a hasty temper, from pulling the trigger too soon. How about symptom number four? You have close friends that are angry. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24 says, Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. And I love that phrase, given to, because this isn't saying, hey, don't make friends with people who, have, who lose their temper sometimes or has an anger. Like, no, like, we'd have no friends. This is saying, don't be friends with someone who isn't given to anger. This is someone who has accepted their state. It's like, this is, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. Or maybe has made an excuse. You know, hey, I'm Italian or I'm Mexican. Like, here's my culture. Like, I'm, I'm wired this way. Like, don't make friends with someone given to anger because you allow them to shape you by proxy, just by hanging around them. And I've witnessed this in many areas, but especially in one, there was an example where there was an angry spouse because they were constantly ragging on their spouse and because there was an actual justified wrong that occurred. But it didn't just kind of um, start some journey of reconciliation. Instead, it festered. No party moved, and it just became resentment. And, of course, they're just spewing all of this stuff behind each other's backs. And this one in particular, they're talking to all their friends. And, of course, misery loves company, and so they're teaching their friends the critical language to be able to speak about their spouses. And the enemy loves this because now it isn't just one marriage ruined. He can ruin multiple marriages. Can I give you a word of advice that a mentor told me? Make friends with people that are for your marriage. Make friends with people that are for your spouse. Don't make friends with people when the going gets tough. It's like, man, like, man, I had a tough week with Natalie. Like, she was just so stubborn. Like, I was trying to get a point across, and she just doesn't hear me. I feel neglected. Man, forget her, dude. Like, come out to Cabo with us. Like, come down to the bar. Like, you need your own time, man. You've been taking care of them, kid. Like, leave those people. That kind of language is people given to anger. What other residues and anger rub off on you? The great physician is trying to let us know that anger is contagious. It hops from one person to another. Stay away from people given to anger. And the last symptom is if somebody has told you you have a problem. If somebody has told you you have an anger problem, chances are <laughs> you have an anger problem. Jeremiah chapter 17, uh, verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I love this verse. Because sometimes we are the least qualified to diagnose our own heart. Our heart is so deceitful. <laughs> It'll try and mask it like, nah, like, you're not angry. Like, they, you're justified. Like, those guys are idiots. Like, are you kidding me? Like, they deserve it. It'll try and mask it. When do we ever have conversations? Heart, are you healthy? Are you angry? Even if we were to ask that question, it is so deceitful. Thank you, Jesus, for the Spirit of God who speaks to us truth. Because anger is like bad breath. <laughs> you can't smell it until it's too late. <laughs> Other people smell it first. So ask someone you trust. 
someone who knows you, someone that won't just tell you what you want to hear. Ask them, honestly, do I have an anger issue? Is there anywhere in my life where I'm unhinged? Thank God for friends like that. You know, the great physician wants to be able to help us with this anger thing. And some of you might be, man, like, God, how serious is this anger thing? We don't have time to go into it, but I'll just cite from Matthew chapter 5. If you ever have time to read it, read the Beatitudes. Jesus said that, hey, you guys were consumed with the whole concept of, like, you know, do not murder. But I say to you, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. And then he goes on and says, if you are presenting a sacrifice to God at the temple, suddenly rem and then suddenly remember that someone has done something wrong to you or vice versa, leave your sacrifice, go and be reconciled, and then come back. And I don't know if you know how drastic this is on what he was saying. He was speaking to people in Galilee, which is three days' journey to the temple. So what he's basically saying is this. If in your normal tradition you go to offer a sacrifice in Jerusalem, you get to the temple, you get near the presence of God, and all of a sudden you have your animal and everything, you recognize, oh man, I forgot. My friend Jeff, I hurt his feelings last week, and that never got resolved. He says, drop the animal, go back three days to your village, make good with him, and then come back. That's how drastic of a point Jesus wanted to make. He's trying to get across the truth that reconciliation takes precedence over sacrifice. He's trying to say, look, it, 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 hey, coming to church is great. Reading your word is awesome. Hey, singing to me in your car, fantastic. But I've been trying to tell you for months to go and ask for forgiveness from that family member. It is such a big deal, even silent and hidden anger, because it interrupts worship. And reconciliation clears the way again. So the remedy for anger is forgiveness. And how in the world can forgiveness be the cure? Because Jesus explains it in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Peter comes up to him asking this question. He says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Basically what he's saying is, God, how, long, how many times do I have to forgive this jerk? He keeps irritating me. And like, when can I be done with him? So he references the law. And Jesus comes back and I says, I do not say seven times, but 77 times. And then he launches into a parable that connects it to forgiveness. You could read it in verses 23 through 35. But I'll summarize it. There's a king who has servants. And, and, they, and he's settling debts, and this servant comes to him in his courtroom, in, in, in his throne room, and this servant owes him five billion dollars. That's how much it is translated into our current wealth. Five billion dollars. And he's saying, look, I'm going to auction off everything you own, your family, everything to repay, which wouldn't have repaid it. And he says, no, and he, and he pleads with them, and he grovels, and the king, out of mercy, says, you know what? I'm going to cancel your debt. In one day, I'm going to cancel $5 billion worth of debt. I'm telling you, what would you do if someone took your mortgage, your credit cards, your, 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 uh, your, your uh, cars, all, all, all the payments there, everything having to do with your college funds? I mean, all of it, your student loans. What happens if you, you, you lumped up your retirement, your nest egg, all of it? He's like, I forgive the debt. I mean... We, we, we'd be having church in here if you was forgiven of that much debt. I mean, it doesn't matter what anyone would do to you. People could cut you off on the 405. You'd be like, oh, no big deal. They must be on a hurry. They, 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 you know, it's all good. Someone could cuss you out to your face. And he'd be like, man, I'm so sorry you're having a bad day. I mean, nothing could phase you. But not this guy. This guy leaves the throne room, and in the hallway, he runs into another servant that owes him money, $12,000. And what's his response? Out of anger, he starts to strangle the guy. Give me what you owe me. And of course, the servant pleads with him and says, you know, let me pay it back. I'll do it in the same arguments he used. But he had no mercy, and he threw him in prison. And then the king found out, oh my goodness. And that's what I'll read. Matthew chapter 18, verse 32. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant. 
I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And check this out. Jesus says this to his crowd. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Like, come on, Jesus, give me an edifying word. Like, what you doing? The great physician says anger is a big deal because it leads to unforgiveness. Anger says you owe me. That's why forgiveness is so critical because forgiveness is the decision to cancel a debt. I'm going to say that again. Forgiveness is the decision to cancel a debt. And you might be sitting here tonight like, but, 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 only if you knew, Pastor Robert, and look, I'm sure that there are plenty of people in here tonight, maybe even watching online, where there is legitimate, unjust hurt and pain. Stuff that no one deserves. And some things can never be undone. But what you do with that righteous anger is very critical. And our great physician says, be very, very careful. Because this can lead to an unhealthy life. And if this is you, and if we're honest, in many ways it's all of us, the great physician has written us a prescription. So here is how we're going to end the service. We're going to go through this prescription. It says, take the prescription as needed. That means this isn't a one-time deal. This is something that we repeat as needed. Number one, write down who you're angry with. Some of you are like, shoot, heck yeah. I, I, you, you're going to need to give me a couple of these. Like... Do not write it down now, especially if they're sitting next to you. <laughs> this is something that you need to do with God when you're at home. Write down who you are angry with. Names can come quickly. Maybe recent past, maybe old history. Some of you might say, look, I'm over it. That doesn't always mean that you're healthy. Some names can take actually time. Maybe talking with the Holy Spirit or a trusted friend or maybe even a licensed therapist to even get to the bottom of what's going on. You can even be angry at a group, maybe the government, maybe society, maybe a specific community group. You could even be angry at yourself. You can even be angry at God. Whoever you're angry with, still write it down, make a list. Step number two in the prescription, write down what they owe you. Write down what you believe they took from you whether rational or irrational, it doesn't matter. Because if you perceive they took something from you, it's real for you. For some of you, it's simple. Man, I, owed, I lent Jeff 500 bucks, you know, four months ago. That guy hasn't paid me back yet. He owes me money. For others, you might be, them. they owe me apology. Some, it might be, man, you owe me respect. I know that for raising kids, that, that's one area of my life. I'm like, Jesus, you have to help me. Lord, be angry, but do not lead me into sin. Like, man, me and Natalie talk about it all the time. And it's like, God, why do I sometimes have trouble controlling my temper around my kids when it comes to discipline? And I felt the Holy Spirit ask me, what do you think they owe you? I'm like, ah, oh. I feel they owe me respect. And he's like, okay. And then, of course, he brings up the word he's all foolishness is wrapped up in the heart of a child. Don't worry about that. Train them in the way of the Lord, and I will give them the respect for elders and for you. But in the meantime, don't let your righteous anger to want to lead and guide them into a right life lead you to losing it and leading you into sin. Maybe for some of you on your list, you owe me attention. You feel neglected, or you owe me a raise. You feel undervalued, or you owe me a society of justice, or you owe me an opportunity to try. You owe me a second chance. You owe me affection. Maybe you took my reputation. You stole my family. You stole my marriage. You took the best years of my life. You robbed me of my teenage years. You owe me a childhood. You robbed me of my purity. There may be some of you in here tonight. Maybe you'd say to yourself, you owe me because you can't believe what you did. 
And so you punish yourself with self-destructive decisions and you stay in toxic relationships because you think you don't deserve better. Whether these debts are legitimate or illegitimate, write them down. Third step, cancel the debt. Forgive. And I know this is a tough pill to swallow because there's three groups of people. People who feel that they believe that they ought to forgive, but they lack the courage. Others that believe that forgiving means letting them off the hook. Or others that believe that, hey, I thought I forgave, but it keeps coming back, these memories. And it causes you to doubt if it was even real or authentic. There's good news for you, my friend. Canceling any substantial debt is impossible without the cross. It's impossible. In Exodus 15, we don't even have time to go into it, but Moses is leading the Israelites through the wilderness, and they don't have any water. They're dying of thirst without water for three days. They come across water. It's bitter. They can't drink it. It's called Mara. And they're complaining. They're overrun with anger. Moses cries out to God, shows them a tree, throws it in the water, and it makes the bitter waters sweet. And in this place... This is the first time where God reveals himself, an aspect of his character. In verse 26, he says, I am the Lord, your healer. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you. And it's so interesting that it's within the context of this miracle because God doesn't just heal our bodies, my friend. He heals our innermost being. The Lord, our healer, can make our bitter water sweet. Anger can make your soul bitter. But thank you, Jesus, for the cross of Jesus Christ, where once he throws it into the waters of your soul, it can make the most bitter waters sweet again. Jesus is saying, place me right in the middle of your bitter place. Place me right in the middle of your place of injury. Bring me right to the epicenter of where you believed you have never been able to take a drink from there. And I will do the impossible. Why? Because I'm Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord your Healer, whatever you do with your list, you have to do something symbolic. Burn it. Tear it up. Write paid in full. If it was your fault, make restitution if possible or reconcile. And then the last point of the prescription, destroy the record. In other words, repeat as necessary. Because debts can be canceled, but your memory isn't erased. But the Lord will show you how to deaden the pain of that and rob it of it's power. So every time the memory comes up, refuse to think of it as a debt that is owed you. But remember, it's a debt that Jesus paid on the cross and satisfied for you. I love the fact that all injustice that ever existed and will ever exist was satisfied in Jesus hanging on the cross. You want to talk about injustice? You want to talk about, I can't believe that happened, it was all summed up in the Son of God taking our place and dying unjustly on a cross for us. I believe we will never know the depths of injustice that happened that day. And Jesus did that on purpose so that we could have freedom in sight of him. This is a healthy life, my friend. He wants us to cancel the debt of others so that it can keep us connected to the debt that was canceled for us. And what I want us to do right now is I want us to respond to him in worship. So why don't you go ahead and all stand to your feet. Because this type of message is not something where I was expecting cheers and amens. Because for somehow, the enemy has twisted this topic into condemnation somewhere where you have to hide and, and, and run away from God on this topic, the same way that we do doctors. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with me. But we have a loving father who understood the tangles of anger. And it's like, you're not going to have to run anymore. My son is going to suffer the greatest injustice for you so that you can come with freedom. And the cross of Jesus Christ can touch that bitter area and make it sweet again. I can heal what no man can touch. I can do what you have doubted for decades. I can do the impossible. So while we're worshiping, I want us to ask the great physician to search us, to ask this question, is there anything you see in me that's unhealthy? Help me to see anger if it's inside. 
Help me to understand the debt if it's there, something that's been taken from me. Help me to cancel this debt, to forgive, and help me to keep it canceled, to be free. This is a sacred moment between you and God. The band's going to lead us in the song. And we're going to start to say, build my life. Because we're not just talking about external circumstances. When we're talking about build my life, it starts from within. Lord, you build my life from within. The parts that have eroded, the parts that I've neglected, the parts that I've been unaware of. Build my life. I trust you, God. Let's worship the Lord. Offer your hearts to him. God bless you as you worship. Thank you.